in August 2006, it unveiled its version of a new crew vehicle, one piece of a master plan to get to the Red Planet. This is America's answer to the Russian Clipper, the CEV, or Crew Exploration Vehicle, called Orion. Just like Clipper's role in the Russian program, Orion will be NASA's new link with the International Space Station. And one day, it will carry a crew to a vehicle headed for Mars. But NASA is also planning to road test its crew vehicle, taking astronauts back to the moon, an important training ground for sending humans to the Red Planet. NASA plans on landing astronauts on the lunar surface by 2020, then constructing a permanent base five years later. In order to be able to go to Mars, we have to learn a lot of lessons on the moon because while you can get to the moon and back in a few days, Mars will be several years. Orion will be doing double duty. It will carry crews to the moon and it will make a quick trip to Earth orbit to transfer astronauts to a Mars spacecraft. It's because of that dual role that Orion does not have wings. When you want to go to places like the moon, when you come home, you're going significantly faster than when you come home from low Earth orbit. You can be going 25,000 plus miles an hour. And when you enter the atmosphere at those speeds, if you had a winged vehicle, it wouldn't stay winged very long. Orion borrowed the blunt teardrop look from the 60s era Apollo capsules, but it's more robust and a lot bigger. There's space for six passengers and 25 tons of supplies. Even better, it's built from a new aluminum lithium alloy, so Orion will be lighter than either Apollo or the space shuttle. But like the earliest space missions, it'll return to Earth by parachute. So going back to the future with the crew exploration vehicle, the crew launch vehicle series, is the right answer at the right time to get us back in the saddle. With Clipper and Orion, the old space race rivals have devised new ways of getting their explorers into orbit. The first step in the big push to put humans on Mars. The next hurdle is much bigger. Design a propulsion system with enough power to drive a huge spacecraft to Mars and back. The lives of the crew will be riding on it. Just a few weeks into the journey, the crew will approach the point of no return. If a crew member was seriously ill or they detected a problem with the life support supplies waiting on Mars, now is the time to turn back to Earth. Past the point of no return, there is no turning back. Earth has already moved too far away. No rescue missions can be launched. They must continue millions of kilometers to Mars and circle the planet in order to come home. Engine failure is a death sentence. There's unanimous agreement that the easiest part of getting to Mars is building the launch vehicles to get the mission off the ground and into orbit. The real challenge is what comes next, designing a propulsion system powerful enough to drive the huge spacecraft from there to Mars across millions of kilometers of space. The Mars Exploration Vehicle that goes from Earth to Mars, and most of it, of course, will come back, is going to be very, very light. We're talking about potentially hundreds of tons. We're talking about a vehicle that is probably comparable in size to the International Space Station, if you think about how big that object is flying to Mars and back. To be able to push that vehicle successfully out of Earth orbit is going to require some pretty heavy-duty propulsion. Some propulsion systems exist only in the minds or on the blackboards of physics professors. At the University of Washington, the electrical buzz coming out of this science building could one day shrink the travel time between Earth and Mars. To go to Mars presently requires a 2.5 year return mission. Our concept is to go there and back in 90 days. Everyone ready? Professor Robert Wingley's fast lane to Mars is powered by a laser-like beam of superheated charged particles. The particles of plasma cross the vacuum chamber in thousands of a second. 
Wing Li wants to generate a plasma beam powerful enough to propel a spacecraft to Mars. You can beam the energy to your spacecraft and remove the need to carry large amounts of fuel, large power systems. Um, it makes it cheaper, it makes it faster, and it's also a reusable system. Okay, fire it. It's futuristic physics that's narrowing the gap between science fiction and science fact. Here's how it works. A space station using its solar panels to generate plasma fires a beam at a passing spacecraft. The superheated beam propels the spacecraft to Mars without ever touching it. It's like the North Poles of two magnets repelling each other. It'll be going at very high speeds when it gets to Mars. It'll be going nearly 30 kilometers per second. That's again four times faster than the shuttle. Stopping a ship traveling at that speed requires extraordinary precision. An unmanned satellite parked in Mars orbit must fire another plasma beam at the approaching space vehicle to slow it down. We have, over the last year, made excellent progress in demonstrating it both experimentally and computationally, and we're totally confident that we can do it in the future. It will be years before Wingley can perfect the plasma beam and get it into space. Mission designers who can't wait for this futuristic technology have two practical choices for propulsion through deep space. Chemical propulsion is created by mixing oxidizers and fuel. When the two react, flame and heat are squeezed through exhaust pipes and out the engine nozzle, creating thrust. A nuclear thermal rocket is a simpler, more efficient solution. Supercooled or cryogenic liquid hydrogen is heated by the nuclear core and comes out the engine nozzle as hydrogen gas. Nuclear rocket technology is actually not particularly new. We were investigating the notion of using nuclear propulsion back in the 1960s. We're on our way now to the Nevada test site where we proved that the nuclear thermal propulsion was the only way that we were going to be able to get men to Mars and return them back home safely. Stan Gunn was one of a team of scientists and technicians commuting to the test site in the late 60s. Gunn developed the fuel mixtures. The tests were successful, but America's interest in space exploration was waning and nuclear was a dirty word. We had gotten to the point where we had proven out the capability of a nuclear rocket and we were ready to go with a practical engineered system for a Mars mission, and yet nothing was done after that, and we got totally stopped. But now, space exploration is back on NASA's agenda, and there's a strong case for nuclear propulsion as the best ticket to Mars. It does offer some very significant advantage, primary among them, the fact that there is a greater thrust that can be delivered by nuclear technology. Another critical comparison, two equal-sized spacecraft, half a kilo of fuel apiece. The chemical rocket burns full throttle for 450 seconds. The nuclear fuel lasts twice as long. That means a nuclear-powered spacecraft is twice as efficient and can go the same distance on half the fuel. Jack Asflats, Nevada. Sacred ground in the history of nuclear rockets. The stand where engines were anchored for testing and the nearby hangar where rockets were torn down. Relics of the past that Stan Gunn believes still have a role in building propulsion systems for Mars. <laughs>